FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Today's show is brought to you by U.S. Gold Corp. U.S. Gold Corp. is a U.S.-focused gold exploration and development company advancing high-potential projects in Wyoming and Nevada. U.S. Gold Corp. has consolidated a district on Nevada's productive cortex trend and is advancing the Copper King project towards production in Wyoming, led by a team of prolific company builders and renowned explorers, including Dave Mathewson, who is directly responsible for several major Nevada gold discoveries. U.S. Gold Corp. is well-capitalized and has an extremely tight share structure with less than $20 million shares outstanding and trades on the NASDAQ, a major exchange under the ticker symbol USAU. To learn more, go to usgoldcorp.gold. That's usgoldcorp.gold. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today is March 26th, 2019. Well, we've seen gold prices come down a bit. A little bit of retracement, not real surprising. Well, why is it happening? What is happening? Those are the things you need to know about. And how do you cash in on the opportunity? Well, our good friend, Ned Schmidt is with us. You know him well from the Value View Gold Report and the AgriFood Value View. And then our good friend Gary Wagner is with us, coming to us live from Hawaii, where I think it's about six hours earlier. So thanks for waking up early for us, Gary. And My Ga- pleasure. <laughs> and your publication, which uh, how, is how I first met you, is the goldforecast.com. So I appreciate you both coming on. So let's let's get the show on the road here. And, you know, I've got questions. I've watched a number of precious metal cycles, <laughs> probably two whole ones since uh, the late, uh, I guess it was the 1980s, believe it or not. I can't believe it was that long ago. But we've got uh, a situation here I think is really kind of interesting. What I want to know is after after really the gold price peaking and silver – in October of 2011, first I'll ask Gary, do you think that the cycle has turned? Actually, I do not. I think that uh, we've been involved in a major, not even a multi-year, but a multi-decade cycle. In fact, I just got uh, finished doing a dissertation on it, a rather lengthy article, in which I take a look at the the, the net change in gold uh, immediately following Nixon abolishing the gold standard back in August of 71. Because prior to that, gold had been rather flat for years. Um, uh, Bretton Woods kind of kept uh, gold roughly 35 to 50 dollars per ounce once the gold standard was abolished of course what happened was we saw it really take off and it actually went to a little bit over 800 dollars for the first time in history and that's when i think that the cycle began that we're still involved in now carrie all right so you're taking a longer perspective an almost 50 year perspective at precious metals prices so ned uh your take on the cycle where we're at right now? Oh, I, I think we've long passed the bottom in, in gold prices. I mean, I'm thinking about the bottom uh, was long ago. And, you know, it, it was in December of 2015. So we're working on the fourth year of the low. And I think people need to recognize that gold is acting different. It's acting far better than the stock market. The stock market, as measured by the U.S. stock market, as measured by the S&P total return index, peaked on October 1st of last year, and it's down about 3%. Gold is up 10% in that same six-month period. I think people need to recognize that we put in the bottom four years ago and that gold is acting better, and that's a message that can't be ignored. People are, are too bearish still. I mean, to me, it's only a matter of when we go through 1350, not if, because the pattern that gold put in place, the parabolic rise to the 2011 high, the move down into a lateral pattern is a textbook pattern. And all you do when you identify that lateral pattern 
is sit around and wait for it to break out. You're no longer worried about the downside. And for the last few months, we've got the Federal Reserve on our side. The Federal Reserve blinks, and that has caused the dollar to go down. The dollar hit a high in the middle of December, and there's nothing stopping it from going down further as long as the Federal Reserve is going to be easy. And that's what they said they do. So the Federal Reserve now got, we now have the power put on gold. So I'm, again, it's a matter of when we go through 1350, not if. Mm-hmm. So it's just a matter of time here. Gary, what's your thought here uh, with well, the Federal? I, I think that Ned's hit it on uh, the nail on the head, so to speak. Um, when we hit the lows and, and realize that these lows were coming off of 1900, we had a multi-year decline. We came as low as about 1040. And on a technical basis, when you look at the market, you had the low in uh, the end of 2016. And then it came up to the mother of all resistance levels that we've got to take out, which is 1370. However, when it came back down, it hit a low of um, 1129. So you had a higher high and then a higher low. Then the following rally took it just to about, uh, oh, call it uh, 1365. When it came down, it came down to a low of about 1181. And that's back in July of last year. And we're still running off of that rally. So on a strictly technical basis, ever since we hit that low, What we noticed was that we've had a series of higher high, excuse me, higher lows, and we've had some really strong resistance at 1370. But I also agree it's not a matter of if, but when we'll go through 1350. 1331 is my next real area that I'm looking at minor resistance. It was a small top that occurred a couple of months ago. And then, of course, 1350 is a top that that just recently occurred. Mm -hmm. So... So it's timing, it's price, it's when the next catalyst comes. And Ned, do you have a thought as far as what the next catalyst? I mean, obviously the Fed's dovish position, their accommodative position, willing, saying interest rate hikes are out of the question for the rest of the year. Is it maybe going to be an interest rate cut by the Fed that uh, leads us to this? It's possible. It seems unlikely, but got to understand what's driving the U.S. economy is the trade war has had an effect. The next one that's hitting is Boeing. Boeing is a real, been the, Boeing has been the sweet spot in our trade balance. It's the only thing that has kept us from a serious trade deficit problem. With Boeing not being able to sell any planes, or the new ones, the 737, whatever it is. Max, yeah. Then you've got the impact of the debt ceiling. The, U- the U.S. government hit a debt ceiling on the first Saturday in March, $22 trillion. It cannot raise any more net new money. So that means government spending is going to decline in the United States or slow down dramatically anyhow. Those three factors are going to make the U.S. economy look weak. So the talk is going to be about the Federal Reserve doing something, and I don't think they have the spine to withhold it, withstand it. And so while they shouldn't cut rates, I think there's a chance they could. In any event, the Federal Reserve is going to keep talking easy money. And as long as they do that, the dollar is going to go down, and that ultimately increases the support for gold. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts, Gary? Interest rate cuts, rises, uh, trade situation? Myself, I find it also uh, a remote, a very, very remote probability that they will lower rates. Now, keeping them low, yes. Holding off on rate hikes, yes. Um, If we do see the economy really slow down, I think we'll, they'll move back into some sort of a quantitative easing program where they'll make money readily available at nearly zero interest rates or a, a percent, two percent. I do not think that they're going to uh, lower it, although the Fed can do anything that they want. The biggest issue right now, the biggest issue is the trade war, because the trade war has affected the global economy. And, and this economy at this point, when you look at it worldwide, 
is a dog chasing its tail. It's it's all um, circular. It's all related. Uh, when one prospers, the rest prosper. When one when one major superpower does not, it affects the other superpowers. So I think that that's uh, the big thing. The second thing is what Ned spoke about, and that is that the dollar was so incredibly strong. I think the dollar index hit 120 uh, before it started coming down. And that's what put tremendous pressure on gold pricing. Obviously, gold's paired here in in U.S. dollars. If you if you compare it to the sterling right now, for example, uh, it it went close back to the record highs again. So it's all relative to what country we're looking at and how it's paired. But the dollar weakness is the big thing that you want to watch right now. Yeah. So, so Ned, we looking at a weaker dollar ahead? Yes, I, I don't think there's any question about that. But you know, one of the things I was thinking here while while listening is that we keep we're looking at this from a U.S. investor standpoint. All of our discussion, obviously, but if you look at it from a European investors, gold is certainly better than the euro. I mean, the euro has got serious problems. Uh, the British pound. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to Brexit, and I deny anybody to bet me that they know <laughs> know something about it. Uh, gold looks good if you're a U.K. investor. Right. If you're a Chinese investor, gold looks good. If you go around the world, Brazil, places like that, gold has been a stellar performer. And I think we're ignoring that the rest of the world is having a very favorable experience I mean, European investors are not going to put their money in a, in a third-tier telephone company in the United States. They, they're going to put it in something else. So I think when the rest of the world is looking at gold, they've been seeing success. They've been making money. They don't have to put their money in technology fantasies in the United States. So I think, I think we need to remember that the rest of the world is having a very favorable experience in gold. Interesting. Yeah, we tend to be so parochial in the United States. Uh, you know, it is still the world's major economy for the time being. How much longer is anybody's guess? But but really, what we're seeing is that uh, the world's, like you said, Ned, experience with gold is completely different than our experience here. And uh, that's something that's definitely worth noting so you know we talked about the catalysts what could what could possibly go wrong there's so many black swans out there on the world economy of which you mentioned one ned uh the euro gary what about these currencies are we living in a world of illusion and the illusions about to end or can they carry out the illusion for another couple of decades, which probably at our ages, we would be very happy for them to do that, right? Absolutely. I, I mean, the, the the thing that we want to realize is that uh, the whole idea of a, a fiat currency is a relatively new thing. It's over the last 50 years. But what I think is really the most telltale sign to where the direction of gold is going is what the big boys are doing. Uh, it came out uh, with the CFTC's uh, Commitment of traders report that major head funds have shifted from short positions to that long. But here to me is, is the real telling fact. And that is, according to Forbes, beginning in 2010, uh, the major central banks around the world began to become net purchasers of gold rather than sellers. Now, that's back nine years ago. But if you look at recent buying, you had the uh, Russians having a large, largest purchases that they've had in some time. In, in 2017, they increased their holdings by 224 uh, tons of gold. It was also reported that the Chinese bought a lot. Russia's central bank bought another million ounces of gold in February. And even India, who had been absent from buying gold, their central bank, uh, they're on record as really beginning to accumulate. So what you've got is when the major banks, and this is according to the World Gold Council, but when the when the major central banks continue to buy, 
even after last year's incredible accumulation by them, I think uh, they're on record as the total combined accumulation last year was 651 tons going into holdings of central banks. That's telling us that the central banks know something that we don't. Or we do, but they're able to act on it. And that is they're filling their coffers with something of real value, gold, not other foreign currencies. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So what about central bank purchases, Ned? Is this the tail wagging the dog or is this the dog uh, not really caring what his tail is doing? Well, if you look at each one of those countries he mentioned, there's a motivation that's... uh, not purely economical. In other words, uh, the only country I think it can think of that's been selling gold is, is Venezuela. Uh, right. Russia is doing it because they don't want to be cut off from the uh, the they don't want to be cut off from the banking system through sanctions. China they're up to their eyeballs in treasury bonds. Yes, treasury bonds. India has serious issues that it's worried about. One is Pakistan. The other one is China. And so they're in a defensive position. So their motivations aren't particularly economic, they're political as well. And so I think you're going to see them continue. I mean, the sanctions the U.S. has put on so many people and duties on their trade that other countries, by those policies, are being forced into gold. They're not going to buy more currency. Because currency only works as long as you can move it through a banking system. And in Russia's case, it can't in a lot of ways. So these countries have a lot of motivation other than thinking about the price for buying gold. So I think they will continue to buy gold. I don't see China, Russia, or India stopping. Mm, Interesting. So that's a trend that's in motion And who knows what other central banks are actually buying gold. It's not necessarily a a fact that they want to share with the rest of the world. So I guess then we're probably heading towards a large breakout in gold potentially. Gary, any idea when this breakout's coming? Well, I I think that on a technical basis, we've got to be able to trade above 1370 on a closing basis. We've got tops that came in in July of 2016, another one July of 2017, then the beginning of 2018, we basically had that triple top. And then the, the closest we've come this year is 1350. We've got to take out 1350, obviously, but I think that the real breakout will occur if and when the market breaks above uh, 1370. But to add back to the point of the central banks, there are a couple of countries that are buying that, that really haven't bought before. Hungary and Poland, for example, are on record as actually beginning to accumulate gold. But to to our other guest's point, he's absolutely correct in that it's not being done just for economic reasons. It's it's being done to be able to a I believe prop up their currency, but to not be so tied or, or chained by any sanctions that the United States can impose because. If you have currencies and the currencies go down, that's one thing. But when you have gold, it speaks spades. It speaks loudly. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, this is a kind of self-destructive behavior by the U.S. as the world's reserve currency to start excluding people from the club who wouldn't have otherwise been looking for alternatives. Now it's like, gee, if we upset them, look what's going to happen. We better find something else to do here. Because, uh, you know, we don't want to be put out of SWIFT or Fedwire or any of the other numerous money transfer systems. And in fact, today I just read supposedly that Russia has its own SWIFT set up and ready to go for the outcasts of that club that the uh, U.S. has uh, has pretty much uh, denied access to the international monetary system from. So... I guess covered some good ground here, covered a lot of interesting things. Ned, if you had to say opportunity wise, uh, stocks, bullion, how do you play this eventual breakout? Well, the stocks, the gold stocks have done exceptionally well. And I think if you already own gold, 
I mean, you want to own some gold. Uh, I prefer coins in the safe deposit box. After you've done that, then you play in the gold stock because the risk in the gold stocks is you're a temporary investor. You'll take 10, 15, 20%, and then you'll run. In the potential for gold, and my number is a little different, I think, than Gary's, because I'm using, I think, the cash market, is 1356, and the train is going to leave the station. So the risk in the gold stocks is that people will be temporary investors. But we have two additional opportunities there, uh, Kerry. One, and I think besides ETFs, one is Barrick's Gold now, and two will be Newmont. Mm. Those are two large companies that if you're an institutional investor and you decide to buy gold stocks, you've got to buy those two. Mm -hmm. And so first you've got to own your gold, and then you can play in the stocks because gold is a more permanent position, and the potential for gold when it hits 1356 is immense. The train will leave the station, and it's not going to stop again for a long time. <laughs> yeah, that's entirely a possibility. Hey, Gary, what's your thoughts here? You know, a couple of thoughts. Uh, first of all, I have to agree wholeheartedly that you have to, I believe, Every investor has to have a percentage of their portfolio in physical gold. I prefer non-numismatic coins. I prefer coins also or bullion, uh, but not with numismatic value because the tendency between pricing can get a little bit flexible. But a maple leaf, uh, anything from the U.S. government, I think is a way to go 10 to 15 percent. My upside target, though, is actually pretty aggressive because I believe, based on the work that I've done, that when we get our next major breakout, and I'm talking over the next couple of years, we will challenge the all-time record high of 1900. My numbers come in at around 2200. But I'll leave you with one thought. Besides gold, there's another huge play, and that is that Russia controls the platinum and palladium to a great extent. We have seen palladium now become the most expensive precious metal in the world. Uh, I, I, I know that we're all of similar ages. We might be a decade apart or so, but I remember palladium being a hundred dollars. It was always a it was always not as as cheap as silver, but it was never a precious metal. You didn't make rings out of it. And that stuff is at fifteen hundred dollars. Now, platinum has really been playing catch up lately. It was under a lot of pressure. But the bottom line is this. The only place it's mined is Russia and South Africa, and Russia controls all the cards in terms of uh, letting supply out. And there could be more upside room in palladium as well as platinum. I think that gold's important, but you might want to consider diversifying a little bit in physical platinum or physical palladium. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so funny. I've been watching palladium for years, probably like you guys. And the average person on the street doesn't even know what palladium is. They barely know what platinum is. <laughs> they're so there's such thinly traded markets. And yet, if you want to have smog free cities in the Western world, there's really nothing else to do but uh, but platinum and palladium. And it surprised me that platinum is a direct substitute for palladium. It's actually a better catalyst and they haven't switched back to it the car companies, they're still doing the palladium. And I just wonder if there's something else going on here with this, you know, but it's, it's interesting. Uh, the one thing that, that, that you do want to realize is that over the next, uh, say, 20 or 30 years, there will be a huge shift from the internal combustion engine over to electric vehicles and electric vehicles, of course, do not use palladium or platinum. They use a lot of lithium, which which is, I believe, a derivative off of uh, the cobalt mine. So that might be something also that you watch. But I think that th the main thing with platinum as well as palladium is the fact that one country controls it and that country has issues with how they're being treated by the other superpowers. And it's the one card they can play saying, well, we, this is something we've got that you don't. Mm. So I wonder if somebody hypothetical consumer out there 
maybe like a Ford Motor Company is stocking up on the stuff and that's driving it higher? Or is it just Putin entertaining himself with the uh, palladium market? To, because, you know, what car cost $40,000, the amount of palladium that really goes into it is relatively minuscule, a few hundred bucks, not a heck of a lot. But when it gets up to a few thousand, uh, some of these companies might wake up and take notice. Anyway, I think we'll leave it at that. So uh, I would suggest you go take a look at our guest sites. Again, Ned's is the Value View Gold Report, the AgriFood Value View and Gary's site is thegoldforecast.com, which means it's been out there a long time. He was able to get that name. Uh, really appreciate you guys coming on. And I'm a faithful uh, fan of both of your sites. If you got any questions or comments out there for Ned, for Gary, please email us, kl at kerrylutz.com. And if you're listening to it as a podcast or on YouTube, then please subscribe, like, and share. Really helps me a lot when you do that. Helps get the message out and helps get uh, these gentlemen's views into your car or on your smartphone or your computer where it wouldn't otherwise be allowed to appear. Gary, Ned, thank you so much for coming on. Take care, Gary. Take care, uh, all of you, and uh, thanks so much for having me. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.